morning, and I hope you are having a wonderful morning. Um, I am excited to see who jumps on and who listens. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, recap a little bit. Um, we have been talking about COVID-19 and, and anxiety and how they relate uh, with each other. And so I just wanted us to kind of go back and review before we begin this lesson. Uh, one thing you might notice, it's just me again. So yay, you've got me. Um, and anyways, last week we really just kind of dove in and uh, started talking about how COVID-19 um, and anxiety affect us daily and what life would look like or maybe who we're concerned about getting COVID-19. Um, this session is a little different. This one is going to look at the economy. And I know that if you were like me and you hear economy, you're like, do one of those faces. But um, I really think that it's a it's important for us, especially as teenagers. Um, and I, I mean, I'm not included on that one. I'm an adult, but um, I wish I had taken a little bit more time to look at the economy as a teenager. Um, I think it's important for you guys to understand where our economy is at. Um, not just because of history and um, replaying itself. You know, um, there's been a lot of talk about um, COVID-19 and the Great Depression. And I don't know if you've heard those uh, relations at all, but if you haven't, um, it's been very interesting. In my neck of the wood, I hear about it a lot. And um, it's something that I'm actually having my students do um, this this week, their assignment was to uh, we've been talking about history and touching on World War Two and the start of World War Two. And uh, so I asked them to write about um, how COVID-19 and how the Great Depression are related. Please apologize. I apologize right now. My cat thinks every time um, the computer turns on that it's his duty to come and interrupt my session. So I apologize. Um, anyways, um, so why we're asking you to just think about the economy is sometimes um, we end up watching, and I know we talked about it a little bit last week, but we turn on the news and we let that be our only source of guidance. And we really get conflicting information. I mean, if you turn on Fox News and watch for 30 minutes, and then stop that and go on to CNN and watch that for 30 minutes and then stop and go to maybe MSNBC or MSN um, news networking channel, you're going to get three very different feels, three very different news presentations, three very different feels of where our economy is at. And so I think it is really important that biblically we um, are grounded in our faith and we really know um, the sources of information that we are relying on. Um, because sometimes even what you think is the greatest news channel in the world, sometimes they make up false news. So I think that that definitely... Uh, relates to the topics that we've covered. It relates to control. It relates to the the study that we just did with Francis Chan. You know, using this to really dive into our faith. And so, anyways, I ask that today that you um, really just kind of pay attention, listen, and then this week I challenge you to look at some of those sources really kind of maybe ask your parents questions that you haven't asked about the economy, like where we're at, uh, what's going on, how stocks are. Um, uh, I know that that is um, the only way I know about stocks is um, my grandpa uh, survived World War II. He was actually in World War II, and um, him and my grandma decided um, very early on that they were going to be investors in something. And um, 
they made themselves very wealthy and you would never know it. Um, they were the type of people that lived in a mobile home. Um, they didn't drive a fancy car. Um, they didn't live unrealistic. They had stocks in Chevron oil. And so when I was little, I lived with my grandparents or my grandparents lived with me. They moved in with me um, in the sixth grade. And so each night we would watch the nightly news with my grandpa and my grandma. And I remember sitting on the floor and then walking me through all this stuff that I had no idea about then. Now I wish I would have listened a little bit more to all those conversations that he told me. He was a very smart man, very smart man with money. Um, didn't play around with it. It was one that he took very serious. He took his stocks very serious. And so um, I kind of learned at a young age that watching some of that, watching the stock market um, was something of importance and that maybe I really needed to understand at a young age. Um, and so anyways, with that, all that being said, I know that was a crazy story, but with all that being said, I hope that what this session does is not bore you, but what this session does is bring to light something that maybe you haven't thought about um, as a teen. And then I hope that you stick around because he does an excellent job of walking us through what it looks like um, as far as COVID-19 and the economy. So afterwards, we're going to go over some questions. I'll answer some questions. And then, as always, please, if you have any comments, please leave them below, and we will do our best to answer them. Reach out to Erin or myself. We're available um, to you whatever way that looks like. Anyways, here we go. The world can be separated into two kinds of people. There are those who love roller coasters and those who hate them. I can remember uh, the first time that I went to an amusement park and waited in a line uh, for an hour. And with every passing minute, the anticipation was building. And we were watching people take off and screaming and going down big drops and high highs and low lows. And, and I had never done anything like this before. And my heart was pounding out of my chest just thinking like, okay, are we going to do this? And I remember there was something called the chicken ramp. It was, it was an exit. Like you could leave. You didn't have to do it. But you'd have to do the walk of shame. And I seriously considered it as we got closer to that, that sound, that click click, 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 and that roller coaster pulled in, and we were about to get on, and it was me and my best bud in sixth grade. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. It's interesting how this source of joy for some is a source of terror for others. Like, what's the difference? Who, who, how can some people, like, go down the big drops and put their hands up, and others are scared out of their mind, don't want to come anywhere near it. They get sick when they think about it or sick when they get off of it. As I think about the difference between those two, I think one group trusts the roller coaster. And they trust where it goes. They believe that they're going to get off and be okay. As I think about what coronavirus, COVID-19 has done to our economy, you, you're probably like me. You, you've heard of close friends and family members who've lost their jobs. A rising unemployment rate. People wondering, hey, what are we going to do? What does this mean? Crowds at the grocery stores and an economy, a stock market that has been wiped out. People facing retirement wondering where it went, what they need to do. I'm reminded of a story in Luke. It says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. 
I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. This man trusted in the roller coaster of wealth. But God said to him, you fool. It's the only time I know in the scriptures where God directly calls somebody a fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. So we have this instruction not to trust in wealth, but rather to be rich towards God. And maybe this is a lesson that we can learn in the midst of, of all of this loss and potential economic disaster that we can always, no matter what is available to us, be rich towards God, to be rich in good deeds, as he says. As I look at the life of Jesus, you know, he says this thing, he's, he, I think there's something in all of us that wants to be great. And this is what we see as wealth is just a means to being great. We all want to be kings. We don't want to worship the kings. We want to be queens. We want to have our own empire and our own kingdom. But Jesus says in Mark 10 that whoever wants to be great must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be last. In verse 45, he says, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. And I think Jesus is just being literal here in the same way that it says here in Luke that we're to be rich toward God, that in this time, regardless of what we have or regardless of what we don't have, we can always be rich in good deeds. There's always something that we can do for our neighbor. There's always someone around us that we can serve. And maybe it's just sending a text message, an encouraging word, a Bible verse. Maybe it's a phone call. Uh, maybe it's, it's asking if you can go grocery shopping for someone or dropping something off for them. How can we be rich towards God? In 260 AD, Dionysius, uh, the Bishop of Alexandria, uh, wrote writings that we still have preserved to this day where he talked about the plagues that happened in Rome, where the pagans fled Rome because their families were dying and loved ones were dying. And yet the Christians stayed there, and the Christians cared for the sick, and the Christians cared for the dying. And it says, he says they, they exchanged their health and well-being so that they might care for those who were dying, so that they may both be serenely happy. And at this time, Christianity exploded because people had never seen someone love like that. They said, how can these people love like this? It doesn't seem like they came to be served, but to serve. I know it's challenging right now to love your neighbor as yourself in the midst of these constraints, but constraints are the birthplace of innovation. And so it's for such a time as this that we are to be the church. I'll tell you what I've seen other people do. I saw a church put a sign in the yard and says, hey, if you need anything or just if you need prayer at any time, call me. And they wrote their number down in a yard sign. Uh, we can use technology. We can use uh, different uh, uh, applications that allow us to gather virtually online. Uh, if, if you can leave the house, if you go grocery shopping, consider getting something extra for, for someone else that might be in need. You can write a note. You can uh, send a letter in the mail. You can make a phone call or, or send a text message of encouraging scripture that day. You can ask someone how you can care for them. I would encourage you to yield to your governing authorities and the instruction that they give you, all while doing everything you can to be the church, to love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to have to be innovative. Some of you will ask, what can we do? And some of you will ask, what can we do? For such a time as this, we're called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. I know that as you turn the page in the journal or the times, as you look at the stock market, as you check on your 401k and, and the different roller coasters that you've trusted in, some of those are fleeting. Some of those have left you wanting. And I would just encourage us to take the attention off of ourselves, to trust a God who provides for us, and to ask those of those around us, who can we serve? How can we care for them? How can we love them?
The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. All right. So that was an interesting way and perspective that Jonathan had. Um, uh, he basically talked about um, roller coaster rides and those people that love the thrill of roller coaster rides and then those that right before it gets started they jump off and he compared COVID-19 and the crisis that we're in to that very thing that people have gone on and enjoyed this ride and then maybe not enjoyed it would be the correct terminology but they've been on this ride and they've stuck through it and then there's some that bailed really early and um the first question that I have for you, it says, how have you and your family primarily received information about the current crisis? Where have you received your information from? Um, I know for my family, um, something that I did very early on was we do not watch it. We do not turn news channels on. And it's not to or because that because we don't want to hear about it but one i have younger kids and my younger kids do not need to bear the stress that us adults are facing and so i really felt very early on that it was something that i would just kind of keep out of our home if um, the kids know that there is covid 19 they do know that it's going on we have changed some things up in the house. When we go out, when we leave the home and we come back in, um, our shoes are off. I mean, right at the door. Um, they know that the next door neighbors have been over many times asking to play during this and we've told them no. So that interaction with other kids has not happened. So basically where I've been getting our information from is just the weekly um, update that we have through the schools and from the governor and then um, if I want a little bit more information um, I have a sister who works home health care and hospice here in Clovis and um, I have asked her a lot of questions really a lot of personal questions because she's on our front lines right now um, she's still having to care for people and as she can no longer leave Curry County um, as far as the line, Curry, the line between Curry County and uh, bordering cities. So she has to stay here. And I really trust her opinion because she's living it. And um, anyways, that's where we have um, received our information from. I would love to know where you guys receive your information from. Do you and your family spend time watching the news together? Is that something that you have talked about? Or do you get it from social media? What is your outlet? Um, and how have you felt about the way the media has covered the crisis? What have you felt as a student when it comes to this? As an adult? Um, I, again, like I told you, we don't have it in our home. We don't have the news channels on. Um, though I will say I have flipped a couple of times and what the one thing that has stuck out to me the most is the fact that we are constantly covering those, um, cities and states, even our own state who's had so many deaths, we rarely hear of the recovery. We rarely hear stories of people who've come through. It's mostly been almost a, mm, I don't even know the right, right word, not dreadful time, but just anytime you flip it on, it's not good. It's not heartwarming. You're even hearing stories of doctors taking their own life because they just can't deal with the crisis anymore. And so really, as far as me, 
I have felt like I, I'm saddened that the media has not covered more, that the media has not um, asked for those who have survived, and we hear stories of people who have come through it. I feel like every time we turn it on, it's stories of people who, who are dying. And I'm, I'm not by any means, please do not feel like during this talk that I am dumbing down a situation or I'm heartless because I'm not. My own sister is out as a nurse, so I'm not. And I have two, not two, one other sister who is an RN as well. Um, actually just received her pin um, this week and she'll graduate as soon as COVID is is released. And so anyways, I want you guys to understand that I'm not going to be down the situation. I just am a person, an optimistic person, and it's very hard to to go onto the news and see that. And I just wonder as a student what it, what it has been like for you you know, because Jonathan Wright talked about the ride of the roller coaster. Have you guys just kind of rode with it and done what they've asked, done what our governor has asked? Or have you just kind of bailed ship early and said, I'm, I'm not dealing with any of it. I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to really follow the rules. Um, I'm just going to follow along with what my parents say. I just really would like to know what your thoughts are at this time. Um, when it comes to your own feelings about economic effects of the current crisis, do you feel like someone who trusts the roller coaster or are you someone who is panicked and ready to get off? So I'll ask that again. In this current crisis, do you feel like someone who trusts the roller coaster you're trusting the ride, and you're trusting that it's going to stop, if it's eventually going to get better, or are you panicked and ready to get off? I think in light of this week, um, this question is a great question, but we're in a pretty positive area right now. We're kind of seeing things reopen. We're seeing Texas, which is reopened, and I know a bunch of people went to Lubbock and had dinner and lunch, and they just shopped and did things because we've been so confined, and um, our state is opening, and so I know people are enjoying lakes and uh, just a few things that our governor has opened. And so, anyways, who are you? Do you enjoy the roller coaster? Or are you ready to get off? Has anyone in your immediate family or church community faced any economic challenges during this time? Um, for our family, for Aaron and myself, we were so fortunate and so blessed that in this COVID time, both of us have been able to keep our jobs. Nobody has been laid off, um, at least not one of us. We have been able to continue to provide for our family, and that has been huge. It is a huge blessing. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to have my job, and Aaron feels the same way. Um, one of his brothers, however, has faced um, economic hard time, hardship. Um, his, his youngest brother, Brandon, um, was laid off from a cotton patch. And so he's having to compensate by yard work and picking up a few extra side jobs that he could do because of the financial kind of crisis that his family is in. I know Aaron's um, mother, um, well, she has kept her job, but Aaron's stepdad, uh, Jean has not, um, unfortunately, was laid off as well. He works for the airlines, and they're looking at not even going back until November. So he will not get a paycheck until then. And I 
I feel every single day I'm so thankful that both of us are able to continue to work because we have been directly affected. We have had family members directly affected. And um, I would just say over and over and over again how blessed we are. I would be interested to hear about you and your families. Um, do you have a family member that has been affected? How have you guys handled this situation? Um, if it's your, if you're, it's like your immediate family that you live with at home, is there something, a way that Aaron and I could come, come alongside of you guys and support you? Um, do you need anything from us? Do you need a basket of fruits or vegetables or just any type of support? Um, we would love to know if there is a way that we could help you. Um, what are some ways... What are some ways um, you can be praying for and actively supporting um, those who may have suffered job loss or may be facing other economic crisis? Um, one way that uh, we have been or I have been praying for people and actively supporting people is just asking people if if there is anything um, we can do to help. Is there anything we can do to support, uh, you know, what can we do to support you? Uh, so far, I have not, even though Brandon is in that situation, you know, we did reach out and ask, but... Uh, there was, you know, so far nobody has taken us up on, on that offer. But um, anyways, I've just, we've just been praying. We pray for our church family. We pray for uh, people who have been out on the streets. You know, when all this hit, the very first thing I thought about were homeless people. Um, where are they going? Where are they sleeping at night? Is our city doing anything to keep them safe? That was my very first thought, and we did some digging. Um, we put our brains together, Aaron and I, and his brother and his wife, and another good friend of ours and his wife. We kind of got together and like, man, how can we tackle this situation? How can we help people who are out and who are displaced? And we found out um, through our, our research that our city is actually helping homeless people by putting them up in... Um, in a hotel out south of town. And so, I mean, we were just delighted to know that there are people who have been stepping up and, and recognize the need. Um, anyways, um, sorry, I felt like something was biting me. Um, anyways, so one of the, the Bible... Um, verses that Jonathan was talking about. The first one was, it's found in Luke, and he didn't read the whole thing, but I wanted us to read the whole thing. It's kind of long, so I want you to bear with me. We're in Luke 12. We're going to read Luke 12, um, 16 through 36. So I'll say it one more time. We're in Luke 12. We're going to do verse 16 through 36. Here we go. Then he told them a story, and he meaning Jesus. Jesus is speaking. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build a bigger one. Then I'll have room enough to store all of my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Then, turning to his disciples, Jesus said, 
That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. For life is far, um, life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest food in barns, for God feeds them. And are you far more valuable to him than any bird? Can you... Uh, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make any of their clothing. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the flowers that are here today, and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat or drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father already knows your need. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock. For it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell all your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And his purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Their treasure will be saved. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there your desires of your heart will be also. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning as though you are waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then he will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and not not. So in this passage, Jesus is telling us that we are not to rely on everything else that worry consumes us daily, and what are we not supposed to do? We are not supposed to worry, okay? And I am a worrier. I, I tend, I told you um, last week, I tend to be um, a type A personality and one that um, has a hard time with letting go of control. I, I try to control a lot of things, and um, God has humbled me very much over the years with things that um, maybe it's either jobs that I've not gotten or promotions that I thought I would love to get and I haven't received. All of that leads me to this is God has me exactly where he wants me to be and why should I worry? There was a week, I will tell you this story, just because I, I'm going to tell you I'm human and I, I made a mistake even as an adult. I won't tell you the whole story because it will probably bore your mind, but I made a mistake and I worried so much that my mistake was going to uh, make other people feel like I was a bad person because I made this mistake. I made it, it was in cheerleading and um, it was just recently and it was with a PO. And if you know anything about POs, POs are purchase orders and it's a pretty big deal and I did it wrong. And I thought that these people who I love and cared about would, would, one, they would not understand what I was trying to convey, or two, they would understand and then they would think of me different. And so, anyways, I had worried for a week, a week. I sent out a message to everybody apologizing and explaining the whole situation and then explaining where I messed up. And I was coming clean about messing up and that everything was my fault and I shouldn't have done what I did. Anyways, I worried so much for a week, like I said. And when I mean worried, I mean I really worried. And I kept praying about it and praying about it and praying about it. Long story short, the lady who I work with at the high school who helps me do POs, she never submitted that PO 
So I apologize to um, basically the head of the financial department. So she works at central office. And I apologize to her. I apologize to many people. And um, anyway, in the end, the lady that I worked with was like, hey, here's my phone number, call me. And she said, Amanda, I never did that appeal. That appeal was never sent. So you're okay. And you don't have to worry anymore. So I just challenge you because this was such a big lesson for me this week. This just happened all this week. And um, I just challenge you to know that when you're worrying and it's keeping you up at night and it's keeping your thoughts going, you know, there's at some point you have to turn over and you have to, to believe that God is in control and that everything is going to be okay. That is why we're in our faith. We're in our faith because we believe in not only a higher power, his power, that we're going to end up being with him one day, but we are believing that he is good. And man, if we're believing that he is good, then golly, we got to stop worrying. That is not for us. That is the devil in himself. He's disguised and he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And man, if you don't think that worrying is one way to destroy you, you have not been up at night until 3 o'clock in the morning some night. Okay? He is. It's a way the devil gets in and gets into your mind and just starts making your head spin. And it goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and never stops. And then you wake up and guess what? You're tired. And guess what you're going to do? Are you going to represent Jesus when you're tired? Well, probably not. What are you going to do? You're probably going to get mad and you're probably going to yell. And it's going to be a bad day. And so anyways, I just challenge you to see this because this is a, the bigger picture of all of this. comes together with God telling us he's got it. He's got it. One of my absolute favorite verses ever was one that we touched on. Luke 12. Verse 34, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Highlight that. Underline it. Triple underline it. Right next to it. Guys, if you want to talk about heart and um, worry and everything, it stems off of this verse right here. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Whatever you are putting into yourself, whatever you are putting into your mind, whatever consumes you daily is going to eventually come out of you. Your heart is where your treasure is. So what I'm telling you, what that looks like, if you are constantly looking at new sources to fulfill you during this time, if, if that is what you're pursuing daily, if that is what you're putting into your mind daily, if whatever it may be that you're putting into your mind daily is going to eventually come out as stress somewhere along the way. Okay? So I guess my, my answer is how do we do this together? How do we help each other together see that there is a bigger picture? See that... COVID-19 doesn't have to have control over us. Anxiety doesn't have to have control over us. Depression and anger, they don't have to have control over us. At some point, we can stand up and say, I'm going to overcome this. And you know what? We can. And how do I know that? Because I'm here, guys. I'm here. And I've lived anxiety. I've lived anxiety. A little bit related to COVID, but... I've lived anxiety. I've lived depression. And guess what? I'm not living in that anymore. I'm not. Not since August. Not since August when I decided to make a health change for myself. And I decided to, um, basically for my family, that I needed to be a better version of what I had been. And uh, anyway, so I challenge you. 
I won't go into all of that here, but I challenge you because this, this is where I found I was wrong. I was pouring things into my life that was consuming me. I had gone all the wrong way. My treasure was not in Jesus. My treasure was not in the Bible. And I'm a 32-year-old adult. And I still get off track. Okay, guys? I still um, have periods of time where I feel like I'm coasting. I still do as an, as an adult. And so I realized my treasure was in something else and um, that I needed to let that go. And I was letting my treasure and all my thoughts and everything be consumed by meditation and be consumed by anxiety and depression. And man, take yourself away from whatever it is. Surround yourself with people who love you and really see a bigger picture. Start pouring positive thoughts into yourself. And it makes a huge difference. I can tell you, you can overcome it. And together we can overcome this. Because here's what the devil wanted in all of this. The devil wanted COVID-19 to take us away from our families. The devil wanted COVID-19 to make people more anxious, make people more depressed. And the devil wanted all of that to happen, to death to happen, to our, our economy crashing to happen. He wanted it all to happen. But we have to understand the bigger picture. We have to understand that there's constantly a battle going on between good and evil, basically, if that's what you want to call it. It's a spiritual warfare that's going on daily. This is a part of it, guys. This is a big part of it. And what he didn't realize when putting people together, the devil did not realize that, man, we are resilient, and we're going to come back, and we're going to come back 30 times stronger. He didn't realize that families would be home playing games together. He didn't realize that communities would come together and feed hundreds of people. He didn't realize that there would be positive stories coming out of people recovering. He didn't realize that states would come together and create things um, the way they have been. So now for future, families are going to be taken care of. And he definitely didn't think we would be teaching kids online. I think he thought maybe technology would crash and we wouldn't get to, to finish our year out and guess what we have. So there's so much positive. But again, you've got to figure out you personally have to figure out what's being poured into you. And are you allowing media to pour into you instead of God? Are you allowing your time, are you allowing hours and hours to be spent on TV and no time in the Word? Okay? What, what is it? So I would ask that you truly look at your heart this week. What are your treasures? What are you storing up? I, I, is it like this guy, this foolish guy who is throwing everything up? Or are you giving 100% of your time to try to help others? Which leads me to my next thing. Guys, we have a lot of people in our community that are suffering. And last week, I made a deal and I was kind of disappointed. I will be honest. We have some really good and awesome kids in our youth group. And I made a challenge. And Aaron and I ended up being the only people to prayer walk at the park to show up. And here's why I'm sad. I'm sad because um, we have people in our community that really need help. We have people who are in desperate need as far as food is concerned, as far as a lot of things are concerned. We have a lot of people who have been displaced from a job. And the best way that we can get back to our community as teens, because I know a lot of us do not have our own money to give, but the best thing that we can do is prayer. Guys, it is so important that we get out and we pray. Not, not only that we're praying for each other, but we're praying for our community. It is so important. I promise social distancing will happen, but guys, we need to make a move. You know, it, it reminds me of um, Jericho and the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. 
I hope you guys knew that story growing up. And if you don't, I pray that you go back through when you find it in the Bible and you read the story. Because the walls came, tum came tumbling down, but it took people walking around those walls that, that a man had built up so high. And God honored that, and those walls came crashing down. And why am I relating this to prayer? And why do you think I'm relating to this to our city? Because our city needs that same prayer, guys. Especially as we start opening up, especially as our state starts opening up, we need to make sure that um, we're ready. And one way as a society that we could be ready and show that we're ready is to come forward and to pray. And um, I really found when I went to Germany um, just how important prayer was, but not only how important it is, guys, how powerful prayer is. Guys, prayer can change everything. And if you don't believe me, man, I can give you many stories where prayer has changed everything. I've been a part of many things that shouldn't have happened. Many people's lives where people should have been dead. Some of my friends, they're still walking today. Guys, prayer changes everything. And I know that it's hard to believe when maybe prayer hasn't directly changed your life. But I think it all comes down to the way we act and what we expect and what we expect to get out of it. And again, it comes back to Luke 12, 34. Where is your treasure? Because your heart's going to be there. You know, if we're not praying for the right things and if we're not praying for the right reason, do you honestly think we're going to get what we're asking for? No. That's not how God works. He's not a puppet, and you don't get everything you ask for. Man, if I got everything I asked for, we'd be living out south of town right now. We'd be having a pool. We'd be having y'all over for barbecues. That's not what we're doing. We're still in this home for a reason. And so... I just want to challenge you and want you to understand that even as a team, it is so important. It is so important. We need to be praying. We need to be actively praying for our city, actively praying for people, because until then, it's going to continue being the same way it was. And I don't know about you, but I've learned a lot over this COVID-19 period. And honestly, I don't want to go back to the way things were. I don't. There's a lot of time that I realized that I'm not spending with my family. That I place other things in front of my family. And I just telling you, do we really want to go back to the way we were? Because we could. We could definitely do that. We could def definitely be the same youth group we were before all of this started. Or we could rise up and we could be different. And we could come out of this stronger and come out of this with ideas that would help our community. And come out of this saying, you know what? We prayed and those walls came down. And our city is open up and it's better than it ever has been. So anyway, I'm going to put this back on the table this week. I challenge you guys to meet, meet us at the park. It's a challenge now. Not a TikTok challenge, not a whatever challenge. It's just a challenge for you to come and to prayer walk with us. A couple of things. One, you can wear a mask. If you feel better wearing masks, go for it. Two, you're going to have adults there. And we will social distance, I promise. Okay? I think Aaron and I have gotten pretty good at the social distancing stuff down. So we will make sure that we are social distancing. Your parents are welcome. Invite your parents. Tell them to come and enjoy this time. But we have got to start specifically praying. 
and we have got to make a change. Because if we constantly let the media, the news, and everybody believe, let them make us feel and believe that we're never going to get better, then man, we're putting our trust and our heart in the wrong source. Because I know a God who promises a lot of stuff. And I know a God who keeps those promises. And I can tell you, I know that we are not going to be in this forever. Matter of fact, I know that it's fixing to get a lot better. And so, anyways, I, I would like us to leave today with prayer. And I promise I won't get on my soapbox anymore. But I just love that verse. And I hope that that is a verse that not only will you highlight and underline, but that you will memorize because it's one that you want to keep for the rest of your life. One that when you're married and you're struggling in your marriage, that you ask yourself over and over again. One when you're up in the middle of the night with kids and you're to your breaking point and you feel like there's nothing else you can do, nothing else you can give. Man, that is a scripture that I've turned to a thousand times and ask myself, where is my heart? And is it in the right place? Because 90% of the time, it's usually a heart issue. And it's usually your heart is not in the right place. And so anyways, I leave you with that. And I leave you with the challenge of meeting us at Tuesday. Tuesday at 4 o'clock. I agree with this. Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just come to you today, and I thank you so much for the youth group. I thank you for the opportunity that you have given in to lead this wonderful group of students. I thank you for the opportunity that you have given to me to just be able to somehow work with these wonderful kiddos and hopefully give messages that, that they will remember, that they will take to heart, and that um, they will just begin to turn to you. Father, I ask for prayers for our community. I ask for prayers for um, our students. I ask for braveness and boldness this week. I ask that you would just place a pressure on their heart to want to join us to pray for our community, Father. This is a time where, where we need it so much and a time where we need to turn to you. Father, I ask that if anybody is struggling today, that you would just lay your hand on them, that you would touch their family, touch their heart. Father, help them with resources and help them to reach out if they don't have the resources that they need. Father, I thank you so much for the word that Jonathan spoke. I thank you so much for allowing us to be in a country where we can open up our Bibles and freely read and use technology and reach people. Father, we are so lucky and we are so blessed. Father, I thank you that COVID-19 does not have control over us and does not have control over our bodies and that we are able to know and not stress and not worry. Just know that you provide for us. Father, that is huge. Father, I ask prayer for everyone's heart this week, all of our students' heart. May we be drastically changed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a wonderful day. Be blessed. Enjoy the sun. Love you guys.